Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. My guest is Lorin White. He is a live sound engineer, monitor engineer, musician, um, and gadabout. <laughs> <laughs> so presently, you are mixing monitors for Lionel Richie. Mr. Lionel Richie, the man. I know you have also uh, done front of house for Mariah Carey, um, a few others. I'm, I'm not sure of your whole history here, but I know you've been you've been fingering faders for quite a number of people over the years, right? This is very correct. Yes, I, I know. Give um, us a little bit of your background. I mean, I know you've been doing live sound for. Live sound has been the bulk of your career. Been the bulk correct? of my career, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, the first band I joined was I went into their rehearsal. They moved. Well, I moved, and my cousin's band was. Uh, they used to rehearse up the street, around a corner from my house, and so you know I'd go and see them and said, "Hey, how about we do something where I'm like, you know, your roadie or whatever." And in in and then the trade off would be to be able to record my own music on you guys, you know, studio system. So basically, at the time, you know, they just uh, they recorded in in, in a, a like their this was a, the keyboard players like living room, and so they have you know not Tas a garage Tascam four track no not a garage an yeah. actual house like they, <laughs> like luckily the manager uh, was was his dad and they just supported. Him. The family, because uh, not only the keyboard player, but the other son who later joined the band was another keyboard player, and so they had a like a full on PV system. We played live, and and then that if you know four track, like I said, Tascam, uh, you know, recorder, and uh, and so I would go over there and record, and uh, we did a few gigs, and. You know, then the next thing you know, I'm mixing sound for them at you know for house, and then they heard one of my my songs, and there was a vocal that they needed, and so they're like, hey, okay, you mix, come up, sing this song, then you go back, back and to mix, <laughs> and then it, one song became two, then yeah. it became join the band. Talk about multi-purpose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's how that that started, and then uh, so that I was I would say at that time I was probably like. 14, 13 or 14, somewhere around there. So that's that's how I started. So, but now you obviously you already had a musical background prior to that. Right. Did you always aspire to be, um, I mean, did you aspire to be the typical, you know, the typical rock star aspiration of wanting to be on stage? Was that the first goal? Or, you know, because some people, I had... they're always, they're always, you know, from, from, from right. early on, were focused on, the technical aspect, right. not the musicals. So. Yeah, yeah. My earliest memories of, of just music is just my parents just playing albums and, and just, I mean, you know, and, and hearing those things. And then I think, uh, you know, for family events, like, you know, you were, speaking of Lionel Richie, you know, like Commodores was one of those things that was played <laughs> in the house, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it was the gamut of music that my 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 dad played, uh, um, and I first would like dance to the to the music as a little kid and stuff like that. And then I heard uh, what was it? I think I, I, if I go back, really, I think the, some part of church wanted me to play, and so I started out as a drummer. And then I went to go visit my cousin in L.A. who who was a drummer, and then I heard his bass player play. And his bass player was just a monster. And then I think at, also at the time, there was this cameo song. And the bass was just grooving. Word up. And I was just, it wasn't, no, it was an older <laughs> cameo tune uh, yeah. way before then. And, and then Prince hit the scene. Mm -hmm. And when Prince hit the scene, I, I, I listened to that album for you. And I was just like, I just want to play. 
I just wanted to play. But I wasn't sure where I was going to go. But I, I think I stayed mainly bass was the thing that just drew my ear more than necessarily guitar, but then kind of reading a little bit of something about he played everything on for you, you know, and, and, uh, and I was just like, I just, yeah, I just, the, there was something about the groove, that backbeat kind of thing that just kind of, uh, woke me up. So my first albums, if you were, my first albums were the Disney albums. And so I was playing, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, my, my parents would give me the whole full on like, reading book and everything like that. But my first two albums that I purchased was for you and 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 whip it by by Devo. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> so that just shows you this two ends of the spectrum right exactly. there. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm literally just, you know, thinking, okay, obviously, uh, you know, that the do 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 so I'm like, okay, let me just figure this out on bass and then I just listened to the for you album. I was, you know, uh even though that wasn't bass, but it, it, it was just one of those things that just woke me up to just wanting to play. And then uh, in through junior high, I started playing sax, I could play tenor. And then once I found out there was, oh, there's a Barry. Oh yeah, let me get back down to that lower register. And then my instructor said, hey, there's one bass sax, bass sax in the unified Oakland school district in San Francisco area. And I'm going, it's mine. That's what I want to <laughs> play. You know, it's this mm. monstrous instrument. Yeah, I just, yeah. Again, went back to that lower register, and then so um, joining that band, I was like the second bass player and another keyboard player. So I had to kind of learn because we all kind of it was always not necessarily the one singer. It was all who can sing this song sure. the closest. Because we did, the, you know, we did originals and we did top forty. You know, top forty was the thing that kind of obviously paid the bills, right? So we did that in the Bay Area, and so it was like okay. Who, who had the closest, you know, tone to whatever music that was there. So mm -hmm. we all kind of learned to rotate. So I learned to play keys, I learned to play guitar, I obviously learned to mix, you know, and it was just one of those things that just kind of grew. Well, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the whole idea of Prince, though, because one of the conversations that I have a lot of times with fellow bassists or bass inclined people, shall we say, right, right. Um, is the idea that a lot of people who gravitate towards bass, they also tend to gravitate towards zooming out and seeing the big picture musically. You know, um, I, you know, Prince, obviously, you know, fascinating in the way he envisioned everything in his head. Mm -hmm. um, even before Prince, you know, who I thought was a freaking monster was Todd Rundgren. If you ever listen yeah, to something, yeah. anything, you know, yeah, yeah. pre MIDI. Yeah. Playing all those parts, parts and conceiving all that stuff, you yes. know. And I think that is interesting to me to hear how you gravitated towards that. And yet, you weren't necessarily drawn to the studio. You were drawn to live music, you know. And that also speaks to the other thing that I'm fascinated about, which is the interplay between musicians. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing that I think, um, as much as I love being able to multi-track everything as much as I admire somebody like Prince for being able to conceive all this stuff. Right. You know, when he went out live, he had a band. Yeah. And it wasn't just because he didn't want to be there himself. It's because he understood that whole interaction, interaction. Yeah. between the musicians. Yeah. And I think that's so important. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, that was the thing about, you know, even writing my own stuff is like, you know, I, I elicited my cousin to, 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 to play drums on it clearly a better drummer than myself, you know? Um, and then uh, the, the guitar players that, that were there, you know, utilize, try to utilize those guys and then tap into their head a little bit, you know, and again, join the band, uh, was in it for a couple of years. And then I just, I wanted to do something heavier. I didn't want to really focus on that kind of top 40 sound. I mean, we were kind of known as the Prince and Time Band of the Bay Area at, for a while. Uh, I might have seen you guys. <laughs> you, you, you might have. I mean, we, we definitely got around. I mean, we we opened up for, uh, we did, did an opening uh, for like Janet Jackson, New Edition, some other stuff around the Bay Area, you know, things, things of that nature. But I wanted to go heavier. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I started a, a, like this metal band with some friends and 
the one guy who was the, the, the clearly our drummer wanted to sing ballads. And I said, guys, let's uh, let's end this right now. Ouch. We want to stay friends. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, you know, I was I was still I was uh, through all that. I was playing football from Pop Warner. And so I, I, I love that external aggression in a different light. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, when it came down to I, had a, I, uh, I tore my back up playing football, but I played in pain, played pain for like the last like five years. And so that scholarship offers and I didn't go, you know, I went to my doctor and he said, listen, you can either be fully paralyzed because partially paralyzed for a little bit. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you give a good hit or take a good hit. And I said, OK, I'm done. So I didn't play my senior year. So I kind of focused back Good on advice. music. Good advice. Yeah. yeah. So I split schools and I was going to go, I did some electronic engineering at Oakland High and it was still at Skyline. And then, so when I graduated, I'm like, okay, I don't really want to do electronic engineering. I go, I, I like that aspect of it, the technical aspect of it. So I ended up going to, to Sac State and then I came back and I was, I was visiting my mom and I wanted to get back into well, the studio really, actually. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a cousin of mine who worked at this producer who lived around the corner as well. Um, and he produced a lot of stuff like Pointer Sisters and some other stuff, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the Bay Area and, and beyond that. But my cousin used to be an engineer in his studio. Well, I, said, I saw him. be Howie Rice, would Yeah, it? no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, I saw him running <laughs> by. I saw him jogging by my house. And I go, hey, you know, have you seen my cousin? And, and he goes, no, he's in Japan right now. And he said, I said, well, I said, uh, hey, is there any ever opportunity to come and work in your studio, be a grunt, whatever? He goes, hey, well, there's this great school that's not too far from here. And it was at Los Angeles College. They had a, a recording arts program. Oh, and right, right. A little wow. emphasis in, in live sound. And so that's where I transferred to. And uh, uh, Rick Shiner and Frank Doherty of the school just, I mean, I gravitated to those gentlemen and I can't thank them enough because they made me the TA, you know, a, a year, less than a year out. And, uh, you know, I came back and, and I got a lot of studio time there. And um, I did a little, uh, kind of little stint at Skywalker Sound, met Craig Sylvie and, uh, and MJ over there. And, and, I, and I, got it, I, I, I got interested in Foley but I was told like, oh, there's mainly you know, females do this. Why do you want to do it? I'm like, that doesn't sound right. What do you no, mean only females right do it? Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. like, what are you talking about? So I was like, someone's bad yeah. information, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, through that, in the interim, I, I, was, I brought in a band into our school. And uh, through another friend, uh, uh, a, f- a friend that you went to Sac State with, he, he knew of a, a guitar player. And they were like, doing a jam session at their house and so i went to the house i was like oh man i want to get these guys to come to the school maybe i'll just do a demo or something and we do a big project you know at the uh at the at the school so i did a demo for them they were excited about the demo and they said hey we're doing a like this other thing at like berkeley square you mind you want to come and mix for us did the, the show at Berkeley oh, so Square. Oh, you've mixed at Berkeley Square. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I remember that room. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's <laughs> trouble by <I> fire. <laughs> so the house guy, we got along. He liked the way I worked and, and just how I approached coming into to the room. He goes, hey, man, I need some days off. Do you want a gig? Mm-hmm. So while I was going to school, studying, recording, I'm now mixing You're live sound in a room. Concept, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in there, uh, there, I, 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 uh, I was there when, before Corn's album was released. There, when Rage Against the Machine did their first record release. I mean, Tool, their first, you know, first record release. You know, it was, um, no doubt that just was wasn't anything like there. It, no doubt opened up for the band that I became their front of house, you know, guy around the Bay Area for it. And then um, one of the, the bands that came through Berkeley Square was Chuck Mosley and his band called Cement. 
And uh, then we would just do two mixes to uh, a, um, you know, just a, a standard cassette kind of thing at the time, board mixes. And those guys, they like, you know, we, we just had a good report. He said, hey, man, give me a number. And on their drive back to L.A., they're listening to the CD in the van. And they called me and go, dude, this sounds awesome. We want you to do like our next European tour. And I was like, yeah, I'm kind of ready to tour. I don't mind. Were you still in school? Yeah, I was still in school. I was I was winding mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, but something happened financially with that manager or something like that. So I didn't do the European tour. I ended up doing the, U the U.S. tour. The, the very next one mm -hmm. and unfortunately um i was doing you know i was doing front of house i was doing the tour managing thing like production managing like this is all new to me you know and driving wow because i was a straight edge guy so um uh, unfortunately uh that tour ended in a horrific van accident uh bass player kind of fell asleep at the wheel and um we rolled the van how do you kind of fall asleep at the wheel? <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. It was one of those things where you just said, like, I was just trying to make it to the next exit. Yeah. Because we 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 yeah. we had a we had one of those crazy schedules, and I I always drove after the gig. I always drove after the gig, and I was there's a point where it's I think I drove like to like four in the morning. And I said, hey, we were going to stop and get gas. He was the most, uh, he was the cleanest one out of everyone else. And he didn't, he didn't drink or anything like that. So I said, okay, give me two hours of sleep and I'll drive the rest of the way. So this was in that two hour window. Ouch. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm waking up actually to something flaring on the, on the radio and him screaming and I'm in the passenger seat. The guys were right behind us, uh, drummers on top of his um, his drum case on top of a futon, guitar players like on the floor behind an SVT with a Mesa boogie dual combo kind of thing. He's on the floor, Chuck's on the back bench. And waking up, uh, and I hear him screaming, and we're sliding in the grass off the highway. So I see this guardrail coming up. And I'm going right brain, left brain kind of thing. Like, tour is going to be fine. Or tour is going to be fine. Everything is going to be good to, oh, my goodness. Oh my God, oh my I, I, I'm going to get impaled because right. I see it coming right from my door. It's it's going both ways. And I mean, it's a matter of split seconds. And I'm thinking he's just going to just get back on the road and we're going to get it. So the, the guardrail slammed just behind my door into the cargo door flip this back on the highway and i watched the mirror just just disappear mm -hmm. like luckily it didn't come back through the window right it just disintegrated and i'm thinking again i'm at this point i'm going lord don't let it be a semi right behind us right right you know mm -hmm. and uh everyone's screaming and everything like that and and Luckily for us, there was an off-duty firefighter and an off-duty nurse in two separate vehicles who saw the whole thing and came to our rescue. Yeah. Ow. So, uh, trying to make this a little quicker here. <laughs> that was Easter Sunday morning. Um, Monday, Chuck went into an operation by Wednesday he was pretty much walking but basically man was yeah obviously no more um but man what an amazing performer to see that guy on stage mm -hmm. you know again I think why I trust base is that you know the the talent of Prince if we go back to that for a second and and, and even uh because Prince I think led me into Bowie I think was was another one of I my influences I could of, that, yeah. of just sonic quality mm -hmm. and and composition. Too. Yeah. He, oh man, yeah. just amazing. Yeah. But I never wanted to be the one downstage. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think that was another thing that drew me back to like being a bass player. Just 
holding down that pocket, right? So being part of a team, being a part of a team, yeah. being, being yeah. a part of a team. I mean, especially when I wanted to get into the metal thing when it, and to the strap went a little lower and I had long hair then. And yeah, I didn't really want you to see my face. And <laughs> I was down on the floor yeah, at the time. Yeah, yeah. That's where I wanted to be. And then when the guy wanted to sing ballads, who later, this is comical. I'm hearing one, of, I think I watched a Saw movie. And at the end of the movie, I hear this voice. It's a metal tune. I'm hearing this voice and I go, no way. And I, I look with the look it up, and it was that gentleman. I love it singing a metal tune, <laughs> and, and they were all some cats from the Bay Area. And I talked to a friend of mine who was a bass player, and I was like, "You got to be kidding me!" I go, "This is something that could have had like when I was nineteen, mm -hmm. you know." Um, but not it was, meant to be. No, it just wasn't meant to be. Yeah. So now, let me ask you because you're. You know, you're drawn to all of these different aspects mm -hmm. of composition, everything like that. Was the whole being drawn to live thing, was that just because those were the doors that opened? Or because, you know, certain, certain people are drawn to the studio because it's a controlled environment. Correct. Because you get a second chance. Great because question. Because you, yeah. Yeah. you know. Right. And there's, there's a different mentality there. There's so a different mentality. What led you to that path? Okay, so coming out of the school, out of school and, and getting the t a chance to experience Skywalker Sound, and, and and then going to Berkeley Square, well, Berkeley Square led me into meeting this other gentleman, uh, Nathan Harlow, who was in a band called Release, mm -hmm. and very heavy, very dreads out, and I and I loved his sound, the way he played, and and his tuning of his bass, and it just oh man, it just it sparked a whole nother thing in me. And so, again, there was like, they lo heard what I did. Their fans were were uh, were happy. And Nathan pulled me over to the film one and, and into the BTP world. Uh -huh. So I did, did that. And, and I think I was always drawn to both because once I got over to the film or in the war field and those guys embraced me there, I got to see, you know, bigger production as far as live sound. So sure. that was one of those things, those technical things is seeing, you know, um, the XL4s, the gambles and things like that. And then- also had decent, to, You also had two decent sounding rooms there. Oh those man, were yeah, full, yeah, both yeah. very no, nice rooms. Great, great, great yeah. places to kind of hone your, your mm -hmm. live skills, right? Yeah. And and then uh, being in touch with, with the ultrasound. But what happened was there's a couple bands that would still draw me into the studio. So I got to do some stuff with Frank Doherty. So he was a producer. He was one of, you know, like Art Blakely and, and numerous other stuff he's produced. And so he would still call me and go, hey, I would like you to like second on this or something like this or, or engineer this. And, and so I liked the duality, but the live energy Adrenaline was yeah. still there because again, being a player, mm -hmm. you know, I like the, the isolness of it, but you know, it's like you go in, I used to go into toast. So, so later on, I ended up, I ended up uh, uh, being one of the guys at, uh, at toast, uh, like with Jakir King and some other cats and Craig Sylvie and, and those guys, uh, Craig Sylvie and Phil Steer with all co-owners of, of, of toast. And, um, uh, um, uh, I like going into the studio, but again, you'd be there before light would come up and, you know, yeah. leave when it's still dark yeah. out, you know? Yeah. But I did, there was a certain energy that was there that was great. And the camaraderie of the engineers were all roughing around the same age at the time and then lear learning and, and trying to, uh, you know, learn as much as I could from Jakir at the time. And, but, I was still, you know, had live gigs, mm -hmm. you know, in between, you know, in between uh, scheduling. And so there was still that live energy of hearing the crowd, being yeah. a part of that. That you know, feedback. Yeah. And that then, and then again, just seeing the musicians that were coming in, because at the time, more so at the Fillmore, you got to mix for a lot of great people. 
you know? Yeah. Um, some, sometimes they didn't come with their engineers at the Fillmore. Where obviously Warfield, um, generally most people came in with their touring package unless uh, I, I later, because of something I did at the Warfield, I ended up getting in, in with Sound on Stage. Mm-hmm. So two engineers brought me into their world because of what I contributed just to their show and they said, hey, we need your number kind of thing. So it became part of Sound on Stage. So sometimes I would bring in, um, you know, full on PA systems and I'd be at front house or, you know, you bring in the monitor rig and your, your monitor. You also got a real someone. diversity of acts. I mean, it's like, you know, you're not just mixing R&B or you're right. not just mixing metal. Right. You know, I mean, I, I think that is, you know, to me, that's more challenging than anything else going from like you know a folk act to a metal act to a but country is it, act to, you know but is well, it because because well, once you put on that lp that day you go to put on absolutely you know absolutely, yeah. bowie yeah and then but, you go but to I think put it takes on a certain, todd rundgren you absolutely know I mean? yeah, yeah. but it takes term. a certain um i think it takes a certain mindset to be able to you know it's not that it's a different type of music and you have right. to you know but it's a different approach. There's there's def- you know? there's definitely a different approach, and that and that was what was great about you know, uh, like, I think I say more say Ber- Berkeley Square was because that introduced me to that because again sure. yeah. we had the you know from Eka Mouse to like I said Tool yep you know yep. what I mean you have mm-hmm. you know reggae so it's again you got to hear the different styles and sonic quality and, and so it's like okay well today. There's going to be more attack in the yeah. kick drum because it's exactly metal, you know exactly. what I mean. It's going to be more heavy tomorrow guitar. Tomorrow it's going to be acoustic guitar and exactly you know, chimey oh, bits up top. Because and all that. we did, we did, yeah. uh, you know, it, 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 at Berkeley Square we did this thing called uh, Well of Souls. It was a very jazz oriented thing. Guess uh-huh. what? That's a whole different mindset. Exactly. Which exactly. Yeah. which was interesting enough because at the Fillmore, um, uh, I got the opportunity to. I mean, this was this is. This is a, one of those amazing days. Charlie Watts came through. Ooh. Uh-huh. And he came through with a quintet. And it was a local orchestra, like a 21-piece orchestra. That that jazz thing he was doing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, and featuring, I, I, I'm, I don't want to mess up the gentleman's name, but I think it's, it's Byron Fowler. He's one, one of the background singers for uh, the Stones. Or I, I think that's his name. Brian Bernard Fowler. Fowler. Bernard Fowler. Bernard Fowler. Bernard Fowler. Yeah, yes. yeah. Bernard Fowler. Yes, 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 yes. So that gentleman was was singing. But I walked up to Charlie as he's setting up his own kit. I had three microphones. And he looked up for me as he's doing this. And he goes, someone finally gets it. <laughs> 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 you know, because he goes, everybody wants the mic every time. Right, I, right. <laughs> I just... I could just go like yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> you know, and 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 so you know, it's set up. I did the show. It's a sit down show at the Fillmore, and some guy off to the distance at a table to to my left goes, and I mean the most quiet part that breaks down is strings are just doing it, and the guy just goes, clearly a little too much sauce. He goes, turn it up, and I go, oh, like <laughs> he just he just killed the whole. Five, and it's like oh, well, there's oh, always one man. of those. Yeah, yeah, always one. Yeah, always one. But I love that about you know the, the minimalist approach. I mean, um, when I taught recording, one of the first things I taught my students was midside mic, mm. and I put it on a piano, and I put it on a drum, and I put it on a guitar. Right. You know, and each time, just showing them, you know, you don't need, you don't need a mic on every tom. You don't need, you know. Six ambient mics in the room. No. You're just making more trouble for yourself. Yeah, yeah. You know? exactly. And especially on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you obviously eventually gravitated towards doing more and more live stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and at a certain point, obviously, shit got real. Yeah, the, the, the more live stuff happened because of getting pulled on tour. Mm-hmm. You know? Isn't that always how it That's, happens? That, yeah, getting... Yeah. You know, having having um, a couple artists that came through, going, "Hey, we really like your vibe, and we, you know, got great feedback on the mix or whatever." And and that right there, you just said yeah. something that I think is really important in the world of live touring, especially. Mm-hmm. I mean, in general, in you know, not just in music, but in, in you know, in life in general, but yeah. especially in the world of live touring. If you're not a good hang, you could be the best mixer in the world and nobody's going to want to work with you. Right. 
Nobody's right. going to want to hang out with you twenty four seven. Yeah, and that I think is really important. It's, a it's tough, learning psychology. It's a tough lesson to learn yeah, because again, I was a straight edge guy, mm -hmm. and sometimes you're sitting with the band, and they're or probably not. In, yeah, right, yeah, mm -hmm. or right, crew yeah. cats that are not. Yep, yep. And more than not, at my early stages was the multiple hats thing. So my thing was not just an audio guy, it was tour manager slash production manager, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to keep the train going oh. and keep cats out of jail. Out of windows <laughs> and stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I wasn't always the best hang then. Mm -hmm. I had my moments, you know, but mm -hmm. it was there was serious times where it's like, okay. I've got to advance this. I've got to do this. I have to be the adult in the room. I have to be the adult in the room. Yeah, I have yeah. to, you know, e e either, you know, the, 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 whether it be the van and trailer tour or the RV and trailer or a bus tour is like, okay, I got to interact with the, the driver because the driver's ready to kick everybody off the bus. Yep. Yep. You know, and I'm trying to control that, but I'm trying to be the, the, the bro, but I'm also having to be the, and you know and i'm like oh this that got very interesting that, for that me that can definitely be you know it's funny because i talk to a lot of a lot of folks who um you know when we've when we've worked as producers with bands yeah. there's always been that balance too of you right. know, on the one hand you want to be the peer you want to be one of the gang on the other hand sometimes you have to be the adult yeah. in the room yeah. and you're torn by that yeah you know it's like how do i do that well how do, it, it, yeah you know? it was it was it was a it was a very tough lesson to learn because again, everybody else is getting to hang yet. You've got to advance the next five gigs because you're at a hotel where mm -hmm. the, yeah. the phone actually works. I got to work. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? And, and I'm, you're, I'm still, by the way, I'm, I'm still being impressed here at the fact yeah. that you grew up in the Bay area and you were a straight edge guy. <laughs> that's you're, a whole nother. Right there. That's, that's a whole nother. That's impressive. That's a whole nother segment, <laughs> especially because of, I think I think it was more 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 of me playing sports because definitely when I served sure. Sure. like with my friends and stuff like that, there was cats, you know, they, they did what they did. But I, I just said, well, in order for me to do this other thing, I need to kind of stay in where I want to stay. Where yeah, I want to stay. That's a self awareness right. that young people typically don't have. Yeah, so yeah, that's pretty yeah. impressive. I mean it also didn't hurt that I learned about the genetic makeup of a lot of drugs early. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a, a sergeant from uh, OPD came through and she just kind of explained what's in certain things that were at the time out there. And I go, I want none of that in my system. They're still out there. <laughs> oh, they're still out there. Yeah. I'm just saying the new generation. Uh, no, no, no. There's, now, there's yeah. all kinds of new, <laughs> new stuff since then. Yep, but, yep. but I was like, I want none of that in my mm -hmm. system. I said, mm -hmm. I want to be able to, I want to be able to play. At, at the time, I wanted to, you know, still play football. I wanted to surf. I, I you know, I was, mm -hmm. I was in the BMX at the time. You know, I, I mean, I had so many other things that I enjoyed. I was an adrenaline junkie. You know, when yeah, my, my yeah. dad got, you know, which explains the whole life sound. Thing. Yeah. It's, I mean that, yeah, ex exactly. Exactly that, yeah. you know, yeah. from, from, you know, water skiing to, to dirt bike riding. I loved all that. And I, that's where I got my rush from. I, 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 I felt like I didn't want that artificial because I feel like that's the thing I don't want to chase where I could chase getting on a motorcycle again. Mm -hmm. I could chase getting back on the field and put my helmet on at the top. Uh -huh. Right. You know, and then I could chase getting on stage, you know, whether it's I'm the monitor guy or, you know, out in front of house and hearing that crowd roar because you did something, you know, you, yeah. you create, you helped be that extension of, of, of a band. Of well, a and project. that's, you know, that's, that's something that's always fascinated me too. The difference between the passive artist, you know, the writer, the painter, the person in the recording studio right. versus the artist who gets the immediate feedback right the performer yeah you know and that's a that's a challenge too because you know you can get feedback that is not very happy correct <laughs> <laughs> consisting of rotten fruit and God knows what else no, very uh, correct yeah. very correct mm -hmm. yeah yeah so um, now where mm -hmm. did you um 
what was the first gig where it really kind of got real where you said you know i'm like you know i'm I'm taking off i'm going on a legit tour here i am the you know i'm really responsible for all this stuff was there a moment when you turned around and, and thought oh man this is like this is my gig you know this right is real. i i mean it's it's it started it started with that first tour almost really with with the with chuck and the guys so you took it seriously i took it serious one. day one yeah, because uh-huh. you know i again they had already disclosed to me what happened about europe mm-hmm. you know and and again i i kind of you know through the the time at berkeley square and 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 just kind of talking to like how my dad was as a police officer and, and us, how we did camping, mm-hmm. you know, it was, a, it was, it was a method to camping. Right. 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 Is up early, get everything set, you know, Stage your everything stuff packed. And, yeah. yeah, yeah you uh-huh. get, then once you get to your destination, yeah. you know, there was a whole thing about maps and, and, uh, you know, especially uh, pre GPS. Oh, this, <laughs> okay. So this is, yeah, this is the thing about, you know, understanding triple A, Hey, give them a call. They sent you every yep. map and, and you had to learn how to read it. And, yep. and mm-hmm. that's what I took very serious. So I, I showed up day one with a string of maps going around the country, you know, and uh, understanding how, how to read it, how to get us there. So uh-huh. that's, that started then I think it got heavier on the audio side of things when I was with a, a, a band called Black Lab because I, again, I had to wear numerous hats in, in, in that perspective. And they were managed by two different managers, uh, one in the Bay Area, one in Southern Cal. And I was with them for years, you know, and it was one of those things where, you know, I've been with some projects that you almost kind of stayed too long because of, you, you know, your you know, you, you find a camaraderie, mm-hmm. you, you know, yeah. you're, you're seeing things that are not going well for the artists, but you're like, I don't want to be the one to jump ship. You know, I've invested time with friendships and things of that nature. Well, that's the part right there. Yeah. I think there are, there are because so many relationships in our industry turn into friendships right. because you share such a degree of intimacy that you don't share yeah. in, you know, a typical like office kind of relationship. Right. right. You know? Yeah, I mean, and once you believe in the music and, you, and you're seeing the response, yeah. that was another thing. It's like we would go and do, you know, record, I mean, uh, radio back when you can radio go is, and actually yeah. go and do a radio thing in the morning, right? Mm-hmm. For for the show that's happening that night. And, and, and they were just amazing players. I mean, you know, I love the songs. You saw the, the 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 response from the fans that maybe just heard him on the radio mm-hmm. that day that morning came out that night and go yeah. now I'm gonna buy the album and, and, and man you felt that and you're just like okay what's going on with management is the record company really pushing this the right way kind of thing yeah. and to see the demise of all of that and being a, a big experience and going wow and I being one of the biggest fans yeah you know, yeah that's the thing right there you know yeah you've invested time you get involved you, with an artist you know part of it is you become you be, a big fan yeah yeah you, you know. become you know and you're also a part of the family in a weird you know yeah it's, yeah it's a way. so you know you're, you you know i like bands like that was like they considered me that extra extension you know mm-hmm. and so i just didn't want to to go and there's other bands uh, that kind of you know very similar things happen um uh you know i i i met third eye blind guys in, in the studio at toast mm-hmm. you know um there was a gentleman was a bass player ryan salazar we knew each other from berkeley square days when he was in a band called Fongo mungo oh i remember those guys yeah amazing another amazing i think we opened for them, amazing, opened band. For them yeah another amazing band yeah yeah dizzy bam uh mm-hmm. the band that uh did the recording they they opened up for them too you mm-hmm. know was, i mean there was a collective of you sure. know there were a whole bunch I, of bay area bands i know yeah we and i mean you, 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 you're other, talking yeah. about the gamut of of music right sure you know sure. from from metal to the deep very heavy to kind of trip 
trip hop bands. Or, oh, that was know, a great scene. Yeah, like, you know, yeah, 80s and 70s and 80s and into the early and 90s. The 90s it was, yeah, 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 it was a really I mean, great scene. So it was a great scene. So it's interesting, like living where I live now, and where I live in Miami, and when I moved to Miami because I, I got married and my wife was there uh, living there and I figured, you know, I'm a live sound guy. I can just need an airport. Not going to be home anyway. So. Yeah, you know, <laughs> just need an airport. And, and, so, mm -hmm. and then there's studios there, you know. And, sure. Um, getting into the Latin scene. And it was a yeah. market, you know, I knew certain Latin bands, obviously, in the Bay Area, From but, the Bay Area but, sure. but not as heavy as what's there, uh -huh. you know. Mm -hmm. And that just opened me up and you know it's just oblivious to um really being immersed in that scene you know um mm -hmm. a good friend of mine once i got there i, I ran into a gentleman named uh, rafael alkins and we did a this thing called dance star usa because a friend of mine they knew good one was on a gig and they were on the, literally on the beach miami beach he goes really? hey man you want to come out? That's you go see, what are you doing? Yeah, and he invited yeah. me out. So we're doing this thing literally on the beach. It is roasting. We're literally, you know, stage on top of the sand, burying the snake deep uh, in the sand kind uh -huh. of thing. And uh, so Rafi and I, we hit it off. And it turns out Rafi was uh, Ricky Martin's monitor. Chief. So then he goes, hey, man, I, I like, you know, our vibe, our the chemistry and what you do. So he brought me on with him. And I was his his uh his monitor assistant and so he had a paragon p2 so we're talking about analog days so he focused on ricky and then i mixed the rest, the rest of the, of the band, band. Uh -huh. and and that's how it started and the next thing you know he got me into into the, the univision camp and the telemundo camp and i started doing a lot of their award shows mm -hmm. and then um next thing you know i was doing some of the in-studio stuff as, as the PA mixer for a couple of their shows. And then that just frequently just in front of those artists' faces and yeah. building mixes for those and tour with a, a few a few of them too. So so let's talk about some of the differences here in perspective from front of house versus monitor beach. Because that's, a, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's that's always been an interesting conversation for me talking right. to crew. Right. And, and since you've been at both, you know, sure. uh, and right now you're monitors. Yes. And you're mixing monitors for Lionel Richie, yeah. which um, now, you know, full disclosure, I saw the show the other day. Yeah. Um, great, great band. Everybody's on ears, which makes life a whole lot easier, no doubt. Yes. And the stage is completely clean. There is not an amp to be seen. No, yeah. Right. Um, there are cones on stage, but there's no amps. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, there's, a, there's an amp. <laughs> there's an amp driving those cones. Yes. Right, right. But, <laughs> but, but yes. But, you know, um, it wasn't always that way. Right. And right. it certainly wasn't always that way for you mixing monitors. Yeah. So, you know, we can get into that whole thing ad infinitum especially mixing monitors for a metal band right. i can imagine that you know they're not on ears and yeah. that's but um let's talk a little bit about the different perspectives from those two seats yeah again coming from berkeley square where you, you know you had to do the fold back from front of house at, at, right. at the time you know had to learn how to quickly you know again, this is this comes back to the the band i joined where we carried our own rig so again you had to do everything you're from, running everything you're running you're everything both. from front of house mm -hmm. right and so I, you know, but basically you were considered a front of house engineer at that time, right? Mm -hmm. Monitors was a secondary function. Total secondary that, you know, function. Hey, can I have a little more bass in my, you know? It, exactly, exactly. exactly. It, it, and again, with we said with cones on stage and, and everything being acoustic mm -hmm. and, and, and everyone playing everything live, it was like, put what's missing. Yeah, yeah. Right? That, that whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. So... As opposed to like in ears where it's everybody, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever their yeah. taste is, because everybody's a little different. That's sure. that's a whole nother. That's a whole when nother. You have that liberty. That's a whole nother gamut. With exactly. Ears. Right. Well, that's just it. With in ears, you have that ability to give everybody their mix. You know? Right. Right. Whereas whatever that is with wedges and, and side fills and stuff, you're it's a compromise. It's a know? compromise. Always. Yeah. It's a compromise. It's, you know, it's one of those things where it's like I always would go to the stage in those days of, of mixing 
uh, uh, monitors from front of house. You know, you know, you had to, you know, there were certain things that timing wise, mm -hmm. you would just kind of automatic, I would just sure. automatically kind of put it there. Cause again, I just knew that kind of from the days when I would have to tweak, go on stage and then play, yeah. you know, yeah. and going, okay. I no need iPad. And right. <laughs> <stuff. Yeah. laughs> no, no iPad. Stuff, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Well, wow. I mean, that, well, there was no, there was no cell phones. <laughs> that's just it, well, man, you know, there were cell yeah, phones. Exactly. Like brick things. Yeah. Anyway. So just going, understanding that as a musician too, it's like, okay, what do we need for time? And what do we need for a, for a key? You know? And so I would just automatically dial that stuff up. And then, you know, someone would say a little more, a little less, you know, right. those, those days, mm -hmm. but you were known as a front of house guy. So again, I toured me as a front of house guy and, you know, uh, some, sometimes in those clubs, again, you're doing the full back from front of house there, or sometimes you would actually have a, a monitor. Well, those, you know, that's, Whoa, luxury. You, that's you, a big club, man. You hit a, a, yeah. a really nice club. Yeah. If you, you must be in the big time, actually yeah. have a monitor desk, yeah. you know, yeah. and, 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 and that way. So, um, I got asked to, it was kind of a full thing. I, I, I started out with third eye blind, then they weren't ready to go to tour. And then I got asked to do a Tracy Chapman tour for monitors. Well, there's a change. Yeah. So that's coming off of a, of a metal tour where I was a friend of house. Wow. Guy. Yeah. And, okay. That's and, diversity in action. Man. Yeah. So Seriously. going back to that straight edge thing, uh -huh. which is what got me the gig with Tracy because she didn't want someone that smoked and someone that was responsible. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. Obviously, I guess if you, if you drank, as long as you did something responsible. So I did that and then came back third eye blind and at that time um they had already started doing some stuff so they had a gentleman by the name of joe wonky amazing uh, a front of house engineer and they wanted me to do monitors and i was like no nah, I'm, I'm not really into that i don't really want to <laughs> tour because at the time i was still trying to build my front of house skills on on larger desks larger venues mm -hmm. and things of that nature so i didn't take them all up on that tour um years a couple years or next album or something like that i go to take in a monitor rig into the regency ballroom from sound on stage and it's third eye blind <laughs> so they go hey man we want you to run monitors while uh -huh. you're here ran monitors and then they said hey we really want you to do the next tour so uh then uh production manager uh, bobby snyder talked to me and we had a good chat and and, and i said okay i'll agree to do it so that's was my first um thrown into the fire about in ears because mm -hmm. we did the hybrid in ears and wedges mm -hmm. and, and full disclosure mm -hmm. i'm going to have you uh as a guest on a panel about okay. in ears wow coming up okay. okay and we'll talk about that off camera but, <laughs> all but, right uh, just to tease the uh the audience here right. because you have been doing in ears for a while and uh again you know it's a totally different world it's, it's a, yeah but i also think you know even all the technical stuff aside there's a completely different psychology and approach to the artists and the music and everything yes when you mix in monitors yes yes because it's not the mix is not for you where you know in front of house most front house guys it is it is for you it's it is for it, you it's for you it, it's for you but you're and, translating right, right obviously you're that extension you're the proxy for the audience right okay? and it, whereas and if the you, monitors right and if you've known the music or you've studied the music okay you're still trying to get all the elements there and, mm -hmm. and you're trying now some bands may want you to translate like the album as right. as much right. as possible mm -hmm. obviously you know, given the yeah. you know, given their instrumentation at the time or whatever they're doing. And some want to be that live sound. Yeah. You yeah. know, they want that live, you know, hey, we we don't even play what we do on the album. You but know, the critical listening skills that you mm -hmm. developed in the studio, right. I think are helpful in terms of that. When you're mixing in front of house, it's really helpful to have those critical listening skills because you can mentally break down those components and translate that to live. Yeah. Whereas with monitors, you're breaking it down, but you're not necessarily translating it back to 
I, I mean, let's be honest. I've listened to some people's monitor mix, right. and it's not even music. Right. <laughs> sometimes it's, it's, I mean, it's you, you know what I'm saying? You're, you're amazed at what they want. Right, right, exactly. But that's, sometimes that's, I mean, I remember someone saying to me on stage, I don't want to hear that person. Yes. And yes. you're like, that, that is a be critical yeah, yeah. part of your sounds. And again, being the bass player that I am, I'm going, I kind of would want to hear that, either the yeah. counter melody of that, yeah. right? Yeah. And you saying you don't, yeah. okay, <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, but that's and what you, I'm saying. There's this different to, yeah. approach Correct. that you have to have to the music, to the humans. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I think monitors in that sense is a very unique position because you're you have to take all those musical skills that you have, right? And more or less break them down to almost unrecognizable components, and then reassemble them mm -hmm. for the gig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, again, you you get the, the the person that just wants to swim in reverb. Mm -hmm. and, and Which you're like, I I don't get that because how do you how do you sing on pitch? You know? Right. Like, okay. But they don't want to hear this here. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't want to hear that. Which you know? is, well, there's a lot of singers who, as, as wonderful as they are, hate the sound of their own voice. Exactly. You know? So, you know, I, I remember a, a, a recent uh, artist that was graced with uh, with going to work for, and one of the, 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 the duel said, I, I want more pretty. I, or, or, no, what she said was, what she actually said was, do you have the pretty? That's what she said to me. Do you have the pretty? And I go, I have the pretty. And she put her ears in and she goes, ah, that's the pretty. I love it. And it was just I, reverb. Yeah, it was yeah. reverb mm. and, a, and a little bit of sheen at the top. And, and I, that's what she said. I had a guitar player yeah. once ask me if I could make his guitar more brown. Right. And, and those studio terms, right? Yeah. You know, where you said, yeah. it's a little, it's a little blue. Yeah. I want yeah. a, I want a little red today. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Exactly. Okay, so what... Does red mean yeah, you know? Yeah. Is that is that a little three K, a little four K, you know, a little edge or something like that? Yeah. And that, like you said, being in the studio, brown is lower mid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, no, it should be something lower. <laughs> yeah, if, it's, if it's a little higher, oh, there's a little. Yeah, yeah, there's a little wrong there's there. something else going on there. So, yeah. So, I mean. Defining those those arbitrary colors and, and textured, you know, the way of someone speaking in a studio mm -hmm. definitely help translate, especially as a, sure. a monitor engineer. Sure. Because everybody's got their own thing. And it's like someone's looking at you and they go, I don't know what to tell you, but my mix is, is that right? this way, yeah. that way. And again, you have to kind of interpret okay, where are they on stage, right? There's that aspect. Where are you, what are you playing on stage? What yeah. are you doing on stage? Yeah. What, where are you physically on stage, right? Because you'd have to go out, and this is what I try to tell young engineers. You can't just be behind the console. That is the worst kind of place to be with some people, right? It's something I learned uh, really even more so when I did, uh, I filled in and, and I became one of her go-to, Melissa Manchester. So she would sit at the piano and have, there's this little general equity here, hear, and do a little wedge out there, kind of kicked out of the side though. And she would do this thing with just tuning it. And you had to, the only way you're gonna hear that is be right here. And she didn't mind if you came right there because she knew once you got that balance of hearing her chewing gum between here and there, you, there's no way you can get that being by an on a mm, console. Okay. Uh -huh. There's no way. Mm -hmm. There's no way. You have to be right there. Yeah. So I learned to to come right where the musician is or artist, if, if, if you know, as long as they you know creep yeah. them out, right, and and be in their space for a second and go, what's missing? Sure. Or what's too loud or, or, you know, or, or just too prominent. 
And sometimes it's room notes, it's a stage resonating or something like that. And you go, okay, now I can go back to the board and assess mm -hmm. how can I help the situation if I can help it, right? Because if something's happening right where they are, you're not going to have that experience behind the monitor desk. But same thing in front of the house. Sure. You know, you're sure. sitting up on a riser and yeah, everything's sounding great. Jump off that riser. Where's your sub? Well, and that's why, you, you know, know, as much as as much as a lot of live mixers fought the whole digital thing when it first came out, for good reason when it first came out, mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you the number of people I've talked to who love the idea that they can walk around and hear what it sounds like over there mm -hmm. and fix it. Right, you know, right. and then come back and, and, you know, I mean, yeah, you're mixing from front of house, but you want to know what it sounds like. In you want to know? Like, yes, yeah. yes, you definitely want to know. And, 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 and I've always been one of those guys, especially in front of house, is throw up the mix. If, if the band's not there, hey, man, virtual sound. Virtual tracks. Oh, man. They yeah. That was. That's a god. That was just a game changer, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, if seriously. you don't get that band that wants to, to sound check or whatever, or if you could just do it before they get there and you can actually then take the nosebleed seats and and, and, and walk the room and actually it's even better because yeah. what you're getting when you're doing a virtual sound check is you're getting them at performance energy level exactly you're not getting them at sound check level. so i'll give you a, a scenario there you know again being a musician you know you know, you know when you just you know you sound check and everyone's kind of lackadaisical yeah. and that yeah. that energy comes on when the crowd goes up right it you know, sudden, I, le like I learned you know, louder. Yeah, yeah, a long time. <laughs> it's like I, uh, you know, I would tell guys when you know when I would be at front of house, and you know, again, I only have limited time because, you know, you're wearing the multi hats. Hey, man, give me show energy, right? But I learned this other term, talking to a drummer, and and I said, I, I would tell him, hey, man, and it's, I had private conversation with, him, go for blood. All right, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he understood mm -hmm. what that meant. Yeah, yeah, because if his energy came up, he brought the rest of the band Absolutely. up, and then that my mix translated. Yeah, as opposed to you know they're you know ho humming it, and then now the the, the yeah. mix goes sideways. Now the house is full, and, and I've got that yeah. artist whose name is on the marquee. Now I've got to fight their energy. For you know the first song, and then you grab the balance, and, and sometimes it's like, okay, do you let that sit down? Do you, do you you know do you start grabbing faders? No, it's like no, no panic. I know what's going to happen. You know, it's it's going to settle down. But there's still a point where, again, you know, you mentioned one of the artists that was with Mariah. It's like no one came to hear the kick drum. No one came to hear the snare. <laughs> it's not about that. They came to hear that one that voice mm -hmm. so yeah. that trick about the gum that i learned from melissa manchester was sometimes she'd be up there and if she smacked i wanted everybody to hear that so yeah. if you you heard whatever whistle that was that day you know, some days you know you know it's like anybody else you know when you know i i remember just you know, like queuing her up before and i go oh man this days when you hear her warming up this day's gonna be a great day and then some days just like all right, let's, okay. let's, today let's, work. let's see. But that's again, that's about live, right? But you that's, know, also, that's what I miss about that live energy, you know? So yeah. It, you know. And, and I think to your point, you, you, you raised a very interesting point there, a very important point, which is people are coming to see, people are coming with expectations. And right. those expectations are not our expectations. Exactly. Because we are already breaking down the music, we've heard it 100,000 right. times already. We're breaking it down to components. We're doing all this critical listening. They want to hear the performance. They right. want to hear the whole landscape. Right. They don't want to get in and look at all the minutia the way we have to do exactly. in order to create that piece of work. Exactly. You know? Exactly. You know, like what seemed it was, it was something I was thinking about earlier today. So he said, say with Mariah, and I remember um, like the studio guy was there or something like that, and she wasn't on stage or anything like that. But we know we were doing some sound checking. And I'm having the drummer just give me a feel on his ride. I always say, give me your feel, because I want to hear their feel. Because their feel is going to be, you know, maybe you're a little heavier on the foot. Maybe you're a little heavier on the hand. Maybe you're a little, you know, whatever. Yeah. I want to hear your feel, because then that gives me 
just the complexity of how you're kind of going to play it to a degree, right? Mm -hmm. And he's doing something on the ride, and I'm, you know, I'm just tweaking to get the ride out because it was something where we just came in, and you know, we're uh, obviously on tour, and the guy said, "Why are you, why are you dialing on the ride, or whatever, or something like that?" What are we, what are we talking about here? I said, "Because if that dude's playing a ride, we're gonna hear the ride. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna be, and no one hears that. Yeah, you know, yeah. I go, there's there's songs in there that that's the groove. Yeah, you know." Yeah. And I'm like, you need to, but but you, you need know, to go away or something like well, that. Well, <laughs> but, but see, that speaks to the whole ability and the whole necessity to zoom in, zoom out, zoom yeah. in, zoom out. You know, I think if you if you have that in mind, mm -hmm. you're always going to do a better job. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah, you know, the audience zooms out. Yeah. We zoom in, right? And then we got to zoom out in order to yeah accommodate now, that. Vision yeah, the of, bigger picture know. of the lighting and the video and and all this other oh, stuff yeah. that. Yeah. It, it, it's it's the spectacle of it all, but it is somewhat the distraction. But I want everyone to like when those people who do tune right back to stage, yep, and they see everyone because there's there's that 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 person that kid that's out there that could be a drummer. Mm -hmm. Granted, still a fan, but like they're a drummer. He's holding that's the in person on that drummer. That's yeah. the bass player. Yeah, like, like, yeah. You know, you want to hear those notes translate. You sure. know. You're, you're the piano player. You want to hear all of that. You know, you're a singer. Of course, everyone's coming to hear that vocal, you yeah, know, yeah. and is, is it translated well? So I try to, 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 to make sure that those elements are there with understanding. Okay. I would go up on stage. I would talk to the monitor person. Hey, what's going on? Because we also had dancers and things like that. And we had to do things with wedges and side fills. And, and so there was energy coming back into our microphone. And so we had this, you know, we would always have a conversation on just keeping it in the loop, mm. you know. And now everybody's got talk back to talk about in ears. Right, right. So I always had my shout. <laughs> I had everybody's communication in there. So, mm. you know, some of times it, it would be comical. But, you know, sometimes uh, with certain monitor people, you know, I could hear, say, a musician say something, and I go, yeah, okay, this is what they're talking about, because maybe the monitor responds, and, oh, I don't really hear that, or or whatever the counter of that is. And I go, oh, no, that's on channel such and such, you know, and, and still do that to, to this day. And so flip that, where now I'm, Lionel, so met Lionel Camp when I was out with Mariah, in front of the house. And so we did a tour together and me and the band just kind of connected and some of the team just connected right away. So I guess my name has kind of been bouncing around in their camp for a minute until, the, until that trigger was pulled and you're like, would you be willing? I go, yeah. I mean, the, the songs. The songs are iconic. Oh, you know? man. I mean, I just, when I was out there in front of the house and I was just going, oh yeah. You know, and it brought me back to that kid Dancing, sure, sure. You know, Same and, here, and, man. Oh. I had forgotten he had done half of those songs. You right. Yeah. You know, and he, as he says, it's like these are the songs of. I don't. I, I almost know. It doesn't matter where you were in your musical genre. You've heard a Lionel Richie song. Well, on I, some, I have to laugh somewhere. about it because you know, a buddy of mine from high school was giving yeah. me a hard time about you know, hey, you would have called that too commercial. Yeah. And I said to him, yeah, you know, you're right, yeah. but. You know, I've spent a lot more years alive now and a lot more years listening to music and understanding music. Right. And man, you know, if you're an artist and you've done one song yeah. that has touched people, yeah. you know, yeah. you're truly fortunate. Right. If you've done half a dozen right. or more, right. man, you know, I'm yeah. sorry, but every yeah. time you go out there, you better be playing those yeah, songs. Yeah. You know? I mean, if you came up in the, the MTV generation where they actually played music, <laughs> you saw, wait, wait. They, you they saw played, dancing on the ceiling. <laughs> the, the M was for music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't even know what. I don't oh, even yeah. want to go there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, you know, you saw dancing on the ceiling. You Absolutely. Know, you, maybe you, you know you heard "We Are the World." You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's just uh, iconic songs, and and to get to hear them, you know, every night. It's, oh, it's 
Yeah. It's and that band is a trans- yeah. Man, that's a great band. It's an amazing, a, it's an energetic band. band, and they play off each other. His really energy well. too, though. Oh yeah, his yeah. energy. So even the next night that you, it, it, there's it, you know, it's all it's all about the crowd, right? It's it's sure. it's how he gets that energy from the crowd. And this is that whole thing about Gabe's talking about live sound, right? And 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 being a modern engineer. So I don't know if you saw the amount of audience mics I have kind of going around the stage. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's to get him up too, right? You know, mm-hmm. if you, because again, you you're you know you've got in ears, and this is why a lot of people didn't like in ears in, in the beginning, and probably still don't, is you know you're isolated. You're isolated. Yeah. You know you're not hearing the room mm-hmm. and the crowd. Well, that's why energy. now they have so many of these with built-in mics. Exactly. So, yeah. so so yeah, there's there's a couple companies and and. And JH is is working, I believe, on something that you know mm-hmm. where, where they have mics built in, and it goes back to actually yeah. engineer. And there's other companies where you have filters and things of that nature, right? And you have your own kind of uh, control of some ambient sound, mm-hmm. which is interesting for a monitor engineer because you you don't know what they're controlling, yeah. and then yeah. so there you know there has to be this give and take of conversation, and sometimes not. Not all artists are willing to have that conversation with their modern engineers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but with him, is giving that energy back to him and then letting him give his energy to them. Yeah. And if you saw that show, it's like he could be somewhere and he goes, hey, you know, and he would respond. And I, I try to make sure, you know, not only the mix of the band and what he he needs, but that he hears all of those little things because then that makes the show oh yeah yeah dynamic because mm-hmm. it changes how yeah Rick House I mean, goes he's, <laughs> and he's a showman in it, you know I mean right. you can tell this is a guy who's been doing this for a long time exactly he's got it down exactly you know? but yeah there is a, a certain joy to the performance there right. it's great to see it right like and that, then so. You know? You know, it's like our conversation is just like he's he's having fun, and if if and if I could bring any artist, you know, you work if you're if they're having fun, guess what they're going to want to do. Yeah, they're going to still want to play. They're yeah. going to still, hey, book me those gigs. Yes, you know what I mean. Yes, exactly. I'm still having fun, especially iconic. I mean, the, the gentleman's seventy three. Just turned seventy three. Yeah, I mean, get away. I mean, no, you Google no. it. Yeah, you know, exactly. everybody knows he's yeah. been around. Yeah, <laughs> Commodore days. You know, yeah. so. Um, but if, and if he's still got the jacket. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. So it's like if he's still having fun, and he's singing at a comfortable place where his vocal is. I still have a gig. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. not going away. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. so, so again, it's 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 all those things. You, you know, it's the um, obviously building a mix that that particular artist wants. So it's like sometimes it's like you meet with a guitar player, they may have a stereo cap, but guess what? They may not want to hear that stereo cap. Right. 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 Or not it, much of it. Yeah. Or mm-hmm. or it's uh, it's completely on one side, and you're like, okay, cool, but that's. That's where what they, need. They, they they sit with it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I I, mean, I remember working with a drummer. He only wanted kick and snare. He didn't want to hear any of his toms. He didn't want to hear any of his overheads. Because whatever, how it translated for him, it was, he could hear subtleties of it, but he didn't want it right here. Yeah. But yeah. he wanted that. But he wanted core. to hear kick and snare because that's what helps him integrate that's, with the rest of the exactly, band. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so you know, there's the drummers that that want their toms panned across. There's the tom. There's some of them. Just, sure. You give it to me straight up. Yeah. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. no reverb, nothing. Just yeah. very straightforward. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sometimes you know you get the, the where the, you know, you have to you have to. Get in that balance of of tuning certain things certain ways. Where this is where my use of say like Digico and Quantum, where they were, you know, you don't want everybody to know this. I guess it's cat out of back. Where you can actually give, you know, a little more compression here, a little higher, you know, mm-hmm. like two 
you know, 4K here with yeah. this person and yeah. then dump that 4K for the next person. Sure. That requires a lot, <laughs> a lot of rehearsal, a lot, and of, pre- a lot of preparation. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, they, hopefully they don't want to change the first song. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, any advice for young people coming in now who don't really know what they want to do? I mean, you kind of, for you, it almost figured itself out. Right. You didn't really say, I want to be a monitor engineer. Right. You, your path led you there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think with a lot of the sound companies now needing people, get in, learn the basics. You know, what a 58 sounds like. Mm-hmm. You know, what this transducer possibly does. You know, the core things of, of just really getting those basics together right and then seeing how you are so some some guys just want to be systems engineers some guys and girls well and that's just want to be actually, systems engineers that's a whole new thing right you know we didn't have systems engineers yeah. you know a few decades ago yeah. but because everything is now networked you yeah, know, you got. We're, we're we're more IT than 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 uh, than not now. Yes, yes, right? exactly. You, you know? got to know Dante. You yeah, gotta know all this other yeah, stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's everything yeah. you know, from all your RF being networked together, or you know, now say maybe your your networking playback. You know, mm. so now stuff's coming over Maddie as opposed to a fan out of a plethora of XLRs. You know. Right. Or, or you, you again go Dante, you know, if that's what you you, you prefer. Um, you know, it's you've got to, as as everyone says, just read the, the manual. Be fine. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you know, it's you know, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube. Obviously, you, you can find out. But if if you just get into you know, whether that's a club environment or, or a sound company that's willing to train, it's just be willing to listen, right? Be willing to listen. Yeah. You, you kind of can't come with your preconceived ideas because, again, you may get in there and you may find yourself, you know, as an RF engineer. Maybe that's what you, 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 you like. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? There's so many aspects of the stuff it. that you may not even realize exists, exists until you get exactly yeah. right, right. Yeah. You know, an SE, like you said, is at the point you were just part of the crew. You know, front of house is throwing up one side of the stage. You know, monitors throwing up the other side of the stage. But then it's like it was a you know front of house engineer to tour. You know, or less it was audio crew chief mm-hmm. that was you know uh, then tuning. But now you know there's uh, you know because everything is is so much more technical with these proprietary systems right so it's like you know everybody's got their own not only speakers but their own amps and then their own drive system right? their own network yeah, yeah. so yeah. you have to know that their nomenclature versus someone else's nomenclature yeah. right and then so it's you know you need to study that but you got to study also the fact of what is psychoacoustics yeah. You know, yeah. now we're getting into the, the things of immersive right. and things How of this the perception nature. of yeah, this sound. Exactly. Be, you know, yeah. it's yeah. like so you see that guitar player there, you know, is that where we're gonna do it? But if that guitar player is there, the brain's going, Why is that? Yeah. yeah. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So there's a there's a whole aspect of just uh, so I, I wanna just go back to this whole cycle acoustic thing. So as a front of house engineer and understanding this is the live from the studio there's that energy from the crowd that you would get, right? And you're 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 creating that world for them. And it's like, okay, am I doing the right thing with the SPL? And following along with the symmetrics of, of the stage, mm-hmm. you know, and and is is it really translating well and and to be able to just sometimes stop and take a look. I was talking to someone the other day about just SPL. And I go, you got to read the room. You know, this is something right. I do within corporate because I do a lot of corporate too as well in between touring. Um, 
why I kind of my trajectory was when my daughter was born. I didn't want to be those dads that one of those dads that was constantly on the road. So I took a brief pushback from from touring. Mm -hmm. So the thing with uh, getting into the Latin world and being into the studio got me to be like home at mm -hmm. night, you know. And and same thing with some of the local corporate stuff that, that happened is I would be in a corporate certain scenario. And I remember this one, this one particular. Um, show caller saying, your your rooms are so much more musical. And I go, because you're I, looking I, at the people. I, I want to thank yeah. you. You yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. I hope that's the right. Yeah. You yeah. know. And they said, no, no, no. It's great because other than that, it's like there's some people are in the AV. It's just loud, 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 loud. And there's the balances and stuff like that. So I translate obviously the musicality of it all. You know, and even between the. The, 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 the panel of vocalists, I try to get what I hear as a cohesive balance other than just levels. But if someone's got a resonating voice, I kind of want that little resonate. If it's, if it's inherently like, so if you go to lob up somebody and you hear this, it's like, let that, let that resonate yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and if there's someone's got a lisp, you're like, maybe, that's yeah, where they tighten up on that a little bit. You know, you do what you can, mm -hmm. you know, with the lob or, 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 or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, try to do whatever thing. So reading the room, I think is another also aspect of front of house, you know, management, right? Mm -hmm. um, other than the translation of the music. It's like, okay, can I go up a couple of these because mm -hmm. that's where the energy is? Can I get pull it back down and get again it's allowing those dynamics to, to breathe right it's well, it comes down to the show it's here yeah and it comes down to what you were saying before right. about audience expectations right. whether i know this artist or not i have certain expectations as an audience as a member of the audience right. you know and reading that i think you know you're right it comes down to reading people reading people yeah so that translates to now monitors yeah right yeah. again it's trying to read so like, um, unfortunately you weren't able to come on stage, but I have a monitor. Obviously they try to give me a, 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 a image of like Lionel's like face. Mm -hmm. So I look at also, you know, it's like you try to position yourself in the monitor to be able to see the artist. And sometimes you're under, under the belly of the stage and hopefully you have multiple monitors. And sometimes it's just a matter of like, okay, he's maybe not going to say anything. Maybe there's just an expression. Maybe he gives a look at the guitar player or looks at the bass player and it's like determining that. Okay, is that a look of just acknowledgement or hey, I got too much or too little mm. of that part, you know? And it's just learning that, that aspect of watching body language, right? And, and just that's also an aspect of it because you don't necessarily get to have that conversation with them. Right. 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 You know, and in a the moment they're in the moment. Yeah. So you can't have that conversation till the next right, day. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. and sometimes it's like you, you, you catch it and you're like right there. And then you may have that conversation. I go, man, you, you caught it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's, those are the things I think I would tell this, anyone who's getting into the monitor side of it. It's not just about getting it loud and side fills and wedges. There's a whole nother dynamic that has to go into trying to tap in quickly with an artist, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes it's not a verbal thing, you know, it's, it's a feel thing, right? Yeah. Um, especially when I do the, like the, when I do the award shows, you only get, maybe 20 seconds of their attention. Right. Because right. now everyone's got a camera around them, right? They're doing a B reel. Their 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 uh, uh choreography people are talking to them and you're like yeah. Hey, yeah. You, and you're, you're best good. if you're, you're really good, good yes. you're invisible to them. Right. That's right. the whole point is they don't they don't want to be paying attention. Right. Right. That's not their Cuz then it starts to job. focus on their head, but yeah. you just let them know in those scenarios I let them know, hey, this is where I am if you need. I got so it. they don't have to go around the room and stuff yeah. on those award shows, you know, rehearsals where you're there 
you know, they've got ears sitting on them for a long period of time for that one song. Yep. So you're trying to make it right real mm -hmm. quick, yeah. real quick, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then get out of their head because now they got to focus on where the cameras are, where the choreography is, where should I be on stage? Is mm -hmm. it pyro or something? And you want to get out of it. So again, it's 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 just reading that person's vibe, even at that point. And this is great. Like you said, like sometimes I'm, I'm literally in the front row and I'm with the iPad and I just, you know, you can yeah. just feel, or you can feel like, hey, they got behind the beat or something. Okay, mm -hmm. do I have something that's got right. got a little tick right. or whether it's click a track or or, or, yeah. a, or a hi hat or something, just to yeah. give them a little bit of timing, or you yeah. see that they're off body wise because now choreography mm -hmm. so that's the one thing about working with artists that do choreography it's a whole another twist on it yeah yeah because sure. there's stuff sometimes in songs that they're snapping off of or, or doing a move to that if we just played a you know the the album it's not the focus Yep. But because of now, now that's part of the choreography, you've got to go find that piece and yeah. Yeah. excite it for them so they actually hit that mark. It's That's a whole other thing that I had to learn from artists who started doing chore choreography, yeah. Yeah. you know? And, and, and building that mix is, is, is something to be different about. You know? But bottom line comes down to paying attention and learning the big picture. Right. Yes, yes. Like you said, it's it, there's this there's this here, and then there's this here. But then right. you dig with the exactly. context, there's going this back here. Out. But where does it fit into that? Right, there? right, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'll just say this now. We I literally just had this conversation with, with Jomi yesterday. We were talking about the studio and live at the same time. Same, same, very similar thing. Where we were talking about when you solo something, and you may be tweaking in and out, and you get that to sound very you know, fantastic. And then you unsolo it in context and you're like, oops, <laughs> whoa, right? Yep. And yep. so he was talking about a, a software to where you could solo it, where it just pushes the the rest of the context of the music back mm -hmm. and, and things like that. And I said, yeah, I said, it's, it's very similar, you know, with us. It's like, okay, you, there's a point of tweaking, soloing just to make sure you got clean signal and things of like that mm -hmm. but you still got to put it back into that context you know yeah. Of, of, yeah. of someone's mix you know always and look at the big picture yeah 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 you gotta look at the big picture you're out here that's your your you know your end goal that's you the know? best advice right yeah. there man. yeah Lorraine White thank you for being on oh this. man thank you sir thank you for having me pleasure. this is this is a pleasure I feel like honored just being here you know? likewise yeah no Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.